Hello, good morning. Uh, we will be giving broadcast and a full webinar in a couple of minutes. We're just allowing some of the attendees to get situated. Please stand by. Hello and welcome to the HFA webinar, Perspectives on Fraud, Money Laundering, and Cybersecurity. I'm Mitch Ackles, the president of the Hedge Fund Association. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our event sponsor, Zenpos Consulting. The Hedge Fund Association is an international nonprofit, industry trade, and nonpartisan lobbying organization devoted to advancing transparency, development, and trust in alternative investments. Our membership includes hedge funds, private equity, venture capital, real estate and wealth management firms, institutional investors, family offices, and service providers. If you're not already an HFA member, please consider joining today at hedgefundassoc.org. Now it's my pleasure to introduce HFA Regulatory and Government Committee member, today's moderator, and technology and data strategist with Zenkos Consulting, Danielle Malachek. Welcome, Danielle. Thank you, Mitch, and welcome, everyone. We are honored to have the opportunity to partner with HFA on a topic uh, that we know, especially right now, is uh, quite timely, financial crime. After our panel, we're going to open it up uh, to audience questions, so feel free to submit any questions during the program to go to meeting. And it is now my uh, pleasure and honor to introduce our outstanding panelists. Uh, my colleague, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Ken Matz. Uh, he is the Director of Solutions Development for Financial Crimes with Zencoast Consulting. I've had the pleasure of working with him over the past year, and he is an experienced consultant for analytics software and money laundering and financial crimes. He has over 25 years experience in advanced analytics, 20 of which were with SAS. Ken works with clients to implement strategies designed to reduce alert fatigue and false positive output rates and to save clients time and money in their compliance, fraud, and money laundering programs and processes. Thank you for joining us, Ken. I'd like to introduce the other Ken. This is Ken Yormark. <laughs> Ken is the uh, practice leader for the Forensic and Litigation Advisory Services within Citroen Cooperman. With over 30 years experience, Ken is a subject matter expert and testifying expert, or excuse me, subject matter and testifying expert in complex global investigations 
and forensic in investigation services focusing on formulating and implementing innovative strategies regarding forensic accounting and financial investigations. Ken also spends time as an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law Center, where he teaches accounting for lawyers. Thank you, Ken. We will be uh, distinguishing the Kens by Ken Y and Ken M. Lastly, we have Michael Bryce, uh, but not least. He is the President and Chief Security Officer with BW Cyber Services. As the founder and president of BW Cyber Services, Michael is a leading expert in cybersecurity in the financial services industry. He possesses over 33 years of in-depth security experience that ranges from his classified work as a Marine Corps Signal Intelligence Officer during the first Gulf War to working on the cyber program for one of the world's largest head funds. In his current capacity, he is intimately experienced in multiple forensic investigations related to wire fraud, data theft, and cyber extortion, also known as ransomware. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. All right, you, let's go ahead and uh, get started. Our first question uh, is for Ken Matz. Ken, as a fraud and AML consultant in the analytics software industry, what additional current concerns are your customers raising and, and how are you addressing them right now? Thanks, Danielle. We're seeing a confluence of a lot of things come together. Even before COVID, uh, customers were thinking about whether getting comfortable and thinking about putting their AML and fraud detection and case management investigations, migrating them towards the cloud. Then when you get things like COVID in the mix and you have new fraud schemes and, and new patterns uh, arising from PPP fraud and um, lending fraud and other things, it just, it puts a lot more into the mix. So what they've had to really worry about is doing more with less, becoming more efficient, not that they weren't already worrying about that, but now there's budget constraints on top of that because of uh, unemployment and other things that are getting in the way. And so uh, we've been talking to them a lot lately about these types of things. They remind us that while those things are all coming together in a perfect storm, that they're used to worrying about landscape changes and risk changes, um, but that they're just happening faster. They're happening more exponentially. They're, they're used to situations when 60 to 70% of the time with FinCEN and worrying about fraud and detecting fraud, things stay the same, maybe they move a little bit, but 30% is always evolving, always evolving. And so we're helping them uh, see how they can do more with less with analytic processes and uh, refining their software, consolidating between fraud and AML together, as well as learning to pick up new schemes that are being brought about by uh, the, the new money laundering schemes and the PPP fraud and some of the loan fraud that's going on. Great, thank you very much. Ken Y, can uh, you talk a little bit about the concerns that you have right now regarding um, companies' risks in the COVID environment that we're, we're currently in? Sure, um, you know, obviously companies have understandably been focused primarily on their operations in this new environment. They're, they're trying to stay afloat in many cases. Um, but structurally, many companies are now different than what they were in the past. You know, we're all working remotely. And, you know, obviously in many organizations, there has been a reduced workforce put in place. Um, and yet, um, these organizations probably have not addressed how this has changed from an internal control perspective. Um, and that becomes a real concern for me. I, you know, I, I like to go back to something called the fraud triangle, uh, where you have three different pieces of the puzzle. You've got pressure, you've got rationale, and you've got opportunity. And those three things are kind of pushing and pulling against each other. And I don't believe there's ever been a time in, in my lifetime in the business world where these factors have been more heightened um, at the same time. All of them are so heightened at this moment. You know, people are feeling pressure, companies are feeling pressure. 
uh, the rationale potentially could be there because you know the person next to them was terminated or they know that there have been massive cuts and they're wondering if they're going to be the next one going and and then the opportunity is really the question that everyone kind of looks at you know with with this change in the environment are there opportunities that maybe were not there before and people might be testing the waters to see if that's the case so i really worry that people are taking advantage of this whole scenario and quite honestly the statistics have really proven that that is the case. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, to, to kind of tag on that question, Michael, um, as our cybercrime cybersecurity expert, uh, what would you consider to be the biggest cyber risks facing asset managers? And what are you seeing those asset managers doing in response to those risks? So, so that's a simple and yet complicated question and the reason why i'd say it's simple is in the asset management industry specifically it's wire fraud wire fraud wire fraud and then fourth is wire fraud um and the reason why i would say that and i want to i want to pony on ken wise answer here is what we're finding is there's a risk reward um relationship with the internet cryptocurrency and wire fraud right now and i, I mentioned cryptocurrency only as a sidebar that makes it so simple for criminals now to work overseas, to have almost zero risk of being caught, and what I'm considering now to be an, an almost unlimited upside to steal. Um, we talk about fraud and theft, and, and we talk about wire fraud. Um, it is in the billions of dollars now. We work with the FBI uh, closely with their cyber command, both in New York, in Orange County, out in Salt Lake City as well, believe it or not, because the asset management uh, there and in Dallas. And I'm, I'm going to give a statistic that was with New York, uh, I want to say a year ago. I can't say it now, but a year ago, if you had a wire fraud and it was $999,999 and you called the FBI, if it was within 72 hours, boy, they would drop everything and do their best to help you. And, and if you have a wire fraud, you know of anybody who has a wire fraud in 72 hours, Give me a call, give the FBI a call, give your bank a call. You, you, you have a good chance of getting that money back. But guess what? After 72 hours, they're not opening a case. I'm talking anything under a million, the FBI is not opening a case for wire fraud. Now, what that means is to contrast that, you know, take out your handy 45, 38, 44 Magnum, I don't know, whatever kind of handgun you have, go down to the local SunTrust Bank and try to make friends with the teller for a $5,000 withdrawal that's not your money. And you're going to have five FBI agents. You're going to have a couple local sheriffs, the state police. You're going to get friendly with a lot of people with badges. And it goes to show the equation and how outgunned and outnumbered we are with wire fraud. Now, the reason why I'm saying that that's a simple question and it's a complicated question, the asset management industry what we're finding is most asset managers now are familiar with wire fraud. They're focused on the outbound side of wire fraud. And so they've got controls in place by and large that we're seeing are protecting against that. Guess what? Criminals are always ahead of us. Asset managers, criminals are now targeting your investors. And I've seen this many times. If you have an investor who intended to put a million, five million, $10 million into your fund and that wire was redirected, they don't care whose fault it was. It's going to be an issue for you, for your reputation. It may be a litig litigatory or a liability issue. So I would just say without a doubt, uh, it's wire fraud. Wow. Yeah, that's that's pretty sizable impact. Um, well, I, I'm curious, maybe we can continue the conversation here, Michael. Um, with the upcoming election around the corner, do you see potential changes in the administration's focus on fraud, cybersecurity, and AML? Um, no. and um, let me look at my crystal ball. Here's yeah. what I can tell you. And, and I'm, I'm going to just kind of go back to the prior reference about that risk-reward scenario. The three biggest belligerents we have from a monetization perspective related to wire fraud tend to come from Eastern Europe, Nigeria, and China. Um, we are seeing more and more around the globe. I think it has to do with the pandemic. There are a lot of intelligent people who are out of work and desperate. And 
have very good ways to monetize their free time. So I would say until we have an administration that is actively focused on going after crime predominantly in those three areas, and, and by going after, I mean boots on the ground and having relationships at the at the uh, socioeconomic, really at the, at the uh, international level, we're not going to see a change. And, and right now, it seems to me that we're pretty adverse with, with the Russians and most of Eastern Europe um, because my my experience is if we indict somebody, nothing happens as long as they don't leave and go to Prague, which just seems like to be the great place for the FBI to go snatch people. And I'm pretty sure we're not getting along too well with the Chinese based on what we're having with our trade conflicts. So we're count, we're indicting them and they're indicting us and nothing's happening. Um, I can't speak for South America, but I'm not hearing about a lot of takedowns there. So right now, unless we have an administration that comes in and wants to change some of our relationships around the world with those countries and actively go after this crime, uh, conf- and then and combine that with the, with what COVID is doing, putting so many people out of work, uh, t- two things come to mind for me. One is I, I don't think we're going to see um, much change from an administrative perspective in the, in the near term. And two, I, I think, unfortunately, it's going to continue to be good for the three of us in our jobs. Hmm. Uh, Ken, York Mark, what, what, or excuse me, York Mark, can you uh, talk about what you, what you think about uh, that question? How would the potential change in the administration change our focus on fraud and, and AML? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously a lot's going to depend on, you know, which administration we, we have in place um, in, in the next three or four months when January comes around. So, you know, I mean, there have been a, quite a few reports by the SEC. I mean, they've opened up hundreds of new enforcement investigations and there have been several large whistleblower awards this year. Uh, but honestly, I don't see much activity and all of the attorneys that I talk to, they all agree with me that they're kind of waiting for the explosion to take place. And I think part of this is that the courts haven't fully opened because of COVID. Uh, But I I think it also goes beyond that. Um, I I can tell you that um, the SEC staff has triaged more than 4,000 whistleblower tips just in a three month period between the middle of March and the middle of May. Now, just to give you perspective on that number, that's 4,000 in three months. Well, in the year 2019, the SEC received a total of 5,200 tips. So the activity is there. Um, it's it's happening. Um, I just don't see the cases really coming to fruition at this point in time. And I think it's because, you know, the SEC is basically focused on a lot of other issues. Um, but just, just remember that uh, Kamala Harris is a former prosecutor. Um, she's a woman who's been fighting crime her whole career. Um, so I think that if, in fact, um, she and, and um, Vice President Biden get into power, um, there will be an enhanced, uh, you'll see a magnitude of increase in this whole activity. And I, I think that, you know, the SEC and the DOJ, um, those, those individuals are kind of waiting for that to happen and for them to get the go ahead to kind of start pushing in that whole. So I think that Yes, if there's a change in the administration, I think you're going to see a major uptick in the activity um, that we'll see in these in these areas. That's interesting. Certainly, some interesting statistics there. Um, and Ken, Matt, uh, from your technology and advanced analytics perspective, um, what are your thoughts? I'd like to pick up on what both of the, the panelists were saying, uh, but mostly what Ken White was saying. It really depends on who wins the the election and, and which bodies of, of government are have the majority. I don't think we'll see a lot of change in some of the statistics that Ken Y was quoting if, if we have a status quo result. Um, if we get uh, in the direction of the Democrats and if Biden and Harris win, we, we know that traditionally uh, democratic regimes have been more restrictive, more regulatory in what they do. And like Ken Wai said, I think we, we get a lot of what he was talking about coming up. And then from the software and the analytics perspective, we would be having a lot more data 
a lot more cases, a lot more investigations to munch through our algorithms. The digital transformation that COVID has sped up, if we then end up having more cases, more investigations, we'll have more data to munch through and it'll it'll add to a lot of the, the patterns and being able to pick up detection and investigation patterns and trends. Very interesting. Uh, so we're heading into some uncharted territory in the coming months, and you both, uh, all three of you, have expressed some concerns about these. Um, can you talk about some of your concerns specifically to the economic consequences uh, as the pandemic continues to spread? Um, and on top of that, how are you advising your clients from both a strategic and tactical standpoint uh, to manage this risk? Oh, I'll start with uh, Ken White. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Um, look, I think the next two or three months are going to be critical. Obviously, the weather change is going to have a dramatic effect on, on people's psyche. Um, people are going to be, you know, cooped up in their houses a lot more in the Northeast and um, in the Midwest. Um, so that's going to be, um, you know, from a psychological perspective, that's going to be very challenging for people. Um, I also think that, you know, the PPP loans um, have dwindled away. Uh, we're waiting for the next round, and that has not happened, obviously. The administration is kind of in a stalemate with regard to that. So. There are companies that are really feeling a lot of pressure right now. Um, and I, what I'm doing is I'm encouraging clients really to use kind of a risk-based approach to really evaluate their controls um, and also their customer due diligence. Um, you know, business has changed, um, risks have changed, and controls really need to be evaluated and modified accordingly. Um, if companies are staying stagnant with these things, it is not going to work well for them. And I, I, I have to go back to this whole fraud triangle thing. Um, and I say, you know, you don't want people to believe that there is an opportunity for them to commit the crime. Um, there's, there's this rule of thumb that I like to go with. It's called the 20-60-20 rule, where you've got 20% of the people in the world who are always going to be good regardless of what's taking place. And you've got 20% of the people in the world who are always trying to figure out the next angle. And those are the ones who are gonna always keep me in business, right? It's the 60% that's in the middle, that's the universe that basically we want to try and control because if the opportunity is there and they have that pressure um, or they really find some rationalization for it, they're gonna take the leap and they're gonna try and go ahead and do something relating to that. And that is absolutely critical that we hold them in, in check. So really the internal control piece is a big part of this whole process. I would also stress the need for enhanced communication within the organization. That is absolutely critical. I mean, if you think about it, we're in this remote environment and people tend to feel isolated. Um, and so delivering a consistent message, frequent messages about company culture, about your policies and your procedures, it's, it, it's, and not just to the, to the top level people in your organization, but to all people within your organization, I think that is gonna ultimately be extremely beneficial in maintaining control over your organization. Great tips there. Uh, Ken Max, what, what are your thoughts? Excellent points by Ken Why um, some of mine overlap and, and expand on that. Uh, we're, we're explaining to our customers and, and we want to advise them, you've got to be more nimble. We've talked about the acceleration of some of the schemes. Ken made a great point about uh, the 20-60-20 rule. Um, you've, you've got people who are always going to be looking for that next angle. Well, as catchers of fraud, as monitors of fraud, as analytics practitioners of fraud, we need to be on the lookout for new and improved, I hate to use that word, but new and improved schemes and ways to go about that. It, it's certainly easier said than it is um, done. So what I want to stress is while you're used to things constantly evolving at some rate, we're realizing, like, like I said a few minutes ago, that this is happening at a quicker rate. And you need to be prepared not to sit on a model that's working or sit on a process that's working. You need to be prepared to rotate quicker. Like Ken Y said with the triangle, new motivations and opportunities to commit fraud given the pandemic have already shown us lots of things. 
And as we get an opportunity to see whatever the next rounds of stimulus or other um, economic recovery opportunities are, it, it's going to bring about new patterns and new new techniques. Fraudsters are always smart. They're always motivated to take advantage of those. So don't get too comfortable with the recent or new detection schemes that you've been seeing from the PPP lending. Be ready to pivot or tweak to incorporate new behaviors. It's hard to keep up with, but as you said, Danielle, in the fra phrasing of the question, we're in uncharted territory, and that means that we all need to be prepared to think differently. Stepping out of the box, very important. Michael, uh, what's your what, what are your thoughts? So we tend to to focus on motivations, obviously, and then the risk reward scenario. And one of the things that I look in addition to criminals motivations are the motivations of our clients, uh, asset managers uh, for PE, not just PE, but for the portfolio companies. And I'm going to kind of give a, a bifurcated answer there on, on the asset management side. One of the things that I'm finding that's extremely um, disheartening, but it's, 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 it's a fact of life. And, and, and that is, Asset managers that we tend to come in contact with are some of the best risk assessors in the world. I mean, their job is to assess risk with financial gain. But when it comes to their assessment of cyber risk, I find over and over there's an institutional um, bias towards ignorance. And I say ignorance because ignorance means you don't know. It's different from, from like being not knowing. It, it, in the ignorance we see, is an assumption that because they haven't been breached or haven't had a wire fraud, that their IT department or their IT managed service provider is protecting them, as opposed to, and I'd call this a misunderstanding and ignorance, that they've just been lucky. And I think what's made this worse is due to COVID, we've had this massive rush to remote operations. And as a consequence, there was a, a quick need for IT to open up and enable people to work from home in many instances where the organization wasn't prepared to do that and, and hadn't put in appropriate security policies. And more so because of that quick rush back in March to, to, to go home, people did everything they could to make things work simpler, more simple. Now we're seeing that because of that, those people working remotely are extremely at risk. And yet the managers that we deal with don't recognize that and have made an assumption that since they haven't been breached that there's no risk there. And I'll just give a couple quick examples because people always like to sell what and stuff. And it's it's really pretty simple stuff. Acceptable use. Every every asset manager I know has a compliance manual with an acceptable use uh, section. And almost all of our clients, not all, but I'd say maybe 75 to 80 percent, have an acceptable use that their employees can access personal email and do some personal things with the computer. And the reason why this one blows me away is that they're spending thousands or tens of thousands of dollars on gateway protections and email protections through their work email, and yet those employees can can go to AOL or Yahoo and download just about anything, you know, cat playing piano or whatever it is. And and those are the methods that criminals are using to attack people. And they're very simple and they're and they're 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 going around all of the protections that that management has in place that they assume are protecting them and we're going to see actually a change wire fraud will continue to be a, you know a crowd pleaser so to speak <laughs> but we're going to see a, a change with proliferation of ransomware and the reason why i mentioned ransomware and i didn't mention it earlier by and large we're seeing portfolio companies get hit with ransomware and the asset managers get hit with wire fraud well, ransomware is so predominant right now and have, making an exponential gain in growth because criminals are now developing ransomware platforms and then franchising those platforms to anybody in the world and then doing gain share for those people that want to be franchisees. Um, it is probably one of the best business models in the world because I, I, it's not taxed, okay? <laughs> Nobody knows who you are and anybody can do it. So. Um, I, I expect and we are seeing a huge uptick in criminal attacks, phishing attacks, successful ransom events, um, and just speaking with, with some people in, in the government recently, payments on frauds are going up because criminals have now gotten sophisticated to the point where the first thing they do when they break into a network, instead of looking for the word wire, they're looking for the word insurance. 
and they're checking to see how much cyber insurance an organization has. And when they ransom them, they're saying, boom, you've got $40 million uh, cyber extortion insurance. That's what I want. We're not discussing anything until you pay that. And there's some big payments. I know of three payments that went out last week totaling $70 million, $60 million, and $35 million. And you don't hear about this in the news. Um, nor do you hear about a successful wire fraud against a PE or, or, or a hedge manager because it's a terribly detrimental reputational event. So there's a certain amount of ignorance because this is not well understood and well known. And then when it happens, there's the, the, the pride or the embarrassment where people don't want to talk about it. So that's where I see it going with COVID right now. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, it's interesting to hear about this platform uh, that exists. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and it actually kind of brings me to my new question, uh, my next question. Um, on the trending topic of, of uh, what we call Frammel. Um, so according to McKinsey, leading institutions are really starting to push the lines between fraud, financial crime, and money laundering. Uh, this, excuse me, and cybersecurity. Uh, industry leaders are learning into this as kind of the holistic and unified approach um, again, the Frammel model, uh, where uh, we can actually pave a way for uh, advanced techniques like machine learning and artificial intelligence to help drive some efficiency in all this work. What are your thoughts on how firms can achieve this strategy? Uh, does it make sense? Um, and based on your experiences, can you also maybe sh share some general best practices uh, that you'd recommend? Um, Ken Matz, let's start with you as our technology expert here. Yeah, Danielle, that's um, I, I got to take a look at that piece by McKinsey, and it was it was interesting. There were a lot of good points. Um, one of the points continues the trends that we've already been seeing to combine the efforts of fraud and AML and BSA compliance, counterterrorism financing into a single initiative. You, you mentioned the acronym FRAML or fraud and AML and consolidating on, you'll, you'll hear companies talk about some of the, the players and we, we've got their fraud and we've got them, their AML, but can you and, and your partners um, combine onto a single software platform for tracking and monitoring as well as for case management? We, we end up talking to a lot of small and mid-sized banks wealth management companies, financial institutions about the solutions and how we can combine those together, not just working with one group or with the other. Whereas even a year ago, and certainly two years ago, so much more, we might get a call for AML in its own uh, little silo. We might get a call for fraud, but now we're, we're all of those calls have, have combined and they're together. The other thing that the article talks about is real-time monitoring of fraud. And I think there's a really good argument there, but, and, and it's an important point to consider, but it needs to be considered from multiple angles. And I've talked to a few of my colleagues about this. Um, real-time monitoring and fraud is a good thing from the perspective of stopping the losses as quickly as possible. If you're a financial institution, if you're a wealth management firm, if you're a bank, that is the goal. How do you stop the losses as quickly as possible? And Michael gave some really good examples from the, the cyber perspective about how big these payments can get. Um, the customers we're dealing with, it's smaller, but it's still sizable. There's still reputational risk. The problem is, is if the premise is that monitoring will generate more alerts to stop fraud faster, then the investigative teams for the non-automated stoppage are still gonna need to triage and work those alerts to then follow up with investigations to cut off the, the leakage of the funds or to cut off the, the, um, the, the, fraud, the fraud losses. But you gotta do that with caution because right now, all three of us, all of us have been talking about the limitations on staff and personnel. And so you get into a situation of time, resources and constraints and how much money are you willing to spend? Are you willing to invest in that third shift round the clock? to work alerts and possibly work investigations overnight that traditionally you don't have staff for and you don't, you're not ready to spend that money. So increases in volumes, the need to decide, are we really gonna staff up to work the non-automated stoppage of the, the so to make that point, are, are you willing, we ask them, are you willing to, to put into place and hire 
investigative stamp overnight. What we have been providing as a best practice, and it, it goes well with what we do for a living, but to take a more efficient approach and research and discuss with the vendors you're talking to, putting into place processes and analytics that help to prioritize the manually responsive alerts, the ones that aren't automated, so that you can get the most productive alerts to be worked first, the ones that are gonna be the highest probability to lead to cases and investigations that are gonna find and cut off those fraud losses. So it sounds like it would be a great idea to, to bring a partner into the equation so you're not having to DIY everything. That's, that's great. Uh, Michael, uh, what, what are your thoughts? It, it's hard. Um, it's real hard. We, we tend to look at it from those organizations that are large and have deep pockets versus what I'd consider to be the small and mid-sized organizations. So I'll take a kind of a, a segregated approach here talk about what we see with the banks and others, um, and then talk more about the, what I'll say, maybe emerging managers to, to mid-sized managers. Um, on, on the financial institutions, you know, they've invested, I, I mean, a tremendous amount of, of revenue to, to address uh, whether it's cyber, whether it's fraud, whether it's any kind, of, um, any kind of crime there. On the cyber side, where I'm particularly knowledgeable, the, the challenge is, is it's been built in a stovepipe. And, you know, you've got basically, you know, the IT geek guys who've gone to the cyber side who want to do their own things. And, and often they're working on a stovepipe and, you know, they're not coordinating with the with the other skill sets. Um, then you find that it gets to be extremely expensive to build that in-house. So you outsource it. What gets even harder if you've outsourced your security operations center to a third party to then have them integrated with your internal entities, which may not be outsourced for the various reasons of, of cost and, and how, how much more leverage you can get from a third party doing, doing that outsource activity. So it's, it's extremely challenging. I will tell you that, that we are seeing a convergence. Um, but then there's this information overload. And, and the real issue here is not the alerting. It's how do you get rid of the false alerts? How do you know where to spend your time in a given day and, and aggregate, you know, gigs and gigs of data. And, and that's where the big software firms are making money, trying to, to help with the incident management event response and all those activities. Um, on the small and mid-sized managers, I'm going to go back to the concept of ignorance. Um, what we see over and over is they lack um, an understanding or an appreciation for the risk associated with the cyber incident to their organization and then how to remediate that outside of their IT department because I always think there needs to be a healthy friction between IT and security. They're two different skill sets. And what we see is over and over, um, small and medium-sized asset managers don't understand the basics, the 80-20 rule. We talked about 20-60-20. 20, 20, I, I love those you know analogies. You know, Pareto is one of my favorite focuses and that is the 80-20 rule. And th there's just a set of basic controls that every organization should be putting in place and managing to prevent cyber fraud. And by and large, they're not doing it. I mean, almost consistently, we, we find very, very simple things. Um, and I mean, I'll just give you a couple because I like to give examples just so people know what it is. But uh, understanding what assets you have. That, that they're actually being patched and upgraded that, I mean, as simple as is antivirus actually working on every computer in the company. These sorts of things uh, you find over and over again, people just assume that it's taking place and then they find out A, that it wasn't and B, no one was checking when there was actually a problem that resulted in, in either a breach or, or fraud or something related to that. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point. Um, I, I think we've definitely seen uh, in our work how um, some of this proliferation of expanding, looking at how much data we have and trying to determine what is going to be the best uh, indicator of fraud is really important. So thanks for mentioning that. Um, Ken, uh, your mark, can you uh, talk about what, what, what are your thoughts? So, you know, I've actually done um, group presentations where I've had a number of these factors from organizations in the same room, right? I've got the money laundering group, I've got the financial crimes group, I've got the cyber people in the room. And we sit around and we run through scenarios and I ask questions about, you know, who does this, who does that? And amazingly, you will see an incredible disconnect take place at times where one group thinks that A is doing it. And in fact, the other group thinks that B is doing it. So 
ultimately nobody is focused on the issue. And it all comes down to communication. It all comes down to really kind of putting together a, a consolidated group. And I, I am all the uh, concept of unification, um, but, but people have to understand that with that unification, there has to be a dialogue, right? And it has to be a continual dialogue. You know, I, I, I work with the guys in my firm, the technology risk and cybersecurity guys, um, on a lot of our matters together, right? We coordinate efforts. They have certain skill sets and I have certain skill sets and we mix and we match. And, and, and that really is, is the way we're gonna do the best thing for our clients. And I think that every organization should be thinking about that kind of coordination. I mean, communication at the end of the day is, is the key component to all of that. Because if they're not talking to each other, if they're not having sit downs to try and talk about case studies and examples, and how they should or shouldn't be working together, it's never going to happen. Um, I, I just, I just think that that's incredibly, incredibly important. As far as artificial intelligence and and machine learning goes, I'm seeing certain things getting better and better every single day. I mean, there have been companies that have talked about machine learning and AI for a while, and it was quite frankly really just data analytics. It wasn't really very technical. Um, but as we move forward with the concepts, I think the software is getting better and better. Um, and and the, the reality is it's only going to continue to get better. But I do think that there's always going to have to be a human factor that interplays with the AI because you just, you just can't figure it all out by having it all being done by some, some computer mechanism. I mean, there, there are life skills and experiences that people, which will really help you get to the granularity of that data and make it really, really more important and make it sing for you. Okay, that, that's very helpful. And, and certainly in the artificial intelligence space, I, I think we've, we've all kind of seen that as, as the trend um, but uh, I'm glad to hear that you're all in recommendation of uh, some of the more advanced strategies to kind of identify some of these. Uh, so shifting gears um, just a little, uh, how would you recommend that firms uh, who are up against these decisions um, approach budgeting um, for cybersecurity, for fraud, for money laundering? Uh, and maybe you could potentially share a few highlights or areas that you're seeing um, that are making the biggest impact or the greatest ROI um, that you've seen with your clients. Um, Michael, let's start with you. Sure. Um, we look at this first off in, in terms of separate IT and cyber from a budgeting perspective. Um, you, you don't want to steal from your IT budget to pay for cyber. Um, relatedly, as I mentioned before, you want a healthy tension between IT and cyber because um, you, you have to have somebody watching over what the other team is doing. And that would be the cyber team. Conversely, though, the cyber team isn't providing operational enablement. If anything, they're making it hard for everybody to do their job. But the way we, we, we recommend people do that once they've set aside a separate budget line is what we consider to be a set of fixed investment. At a minimum, there's a certain bare minimum you should be investing in. And this gets back to, to what I mentioned before, the, the, the ignorance factor, and that is cure the ignorance. And that, that starts with an assessment. So every organization should have an assessment. Um, I like to say that cyber, in the way it's been rolled out by the SEC and the NFA and the CFTC and, and, um, and FINRA, is just like AML. They, they first kind of gave a warning shot back in 2014, I think, then they basically said, okay, it's uh, it's policy as it's, it's time rolled out, but they didn't really enforce. And then they started kind of dipping their toe. Well, guess what, guys? They're they're enforcing now, and they're making a big point when people aren't compliant, and they're going to enforce more, and they're gonna they're gonna look. The program's going to grow. It's not going away. So we look at the budgeting as it relates to cyber as an ongoing, growing program. So you have to start, and at first thing, you just have to know where you stand. And that's the risk assessment component of your cyber program. Um, and then understand what it takes to be compliant. We, we have many clients that, that they've been told by their IT department that they're compliant and they have a document and they think they're good. And unfortunately to me, they've, they've wasted their time and they're not compliant and they have a false sense of security. So I'd say once, once you have a baseline of your as is, um, at that point, there's some basics, like I mentioned before, the 80-20 to put in place and address. Get good 
at investing in the basics. One of my favorite expressions is, is what they say in the medical industry. When you hear hoofbeats, don't look for zebras. Well, it's the same way in cyber, you know, focus on those things that are non-glamorous. You don't need the big ticket $1 million software solutions to, to save your, to, to protect your company when you're not doing the absolute basics. So I'd say you fixed, fixed fee on your, your assessment, um, a couple of basic programs like penetration tests, vulnerability assessments, uh, ongoing phishing, obviously training is a, such a critical, critical component of every organization. And then understand and develop a remediation program that should go out over a year. And after you do that first budgeting cycle, you're going to have a good idea for where you need to go next year. And the, the key there is you're always going to have more vulnerabilities than remediation. So it's, again, focusing on defense in depth. Um, I do tell people to stay away from trying to give a percentage of revenue for cyber initially. Just understand cyber and understand how to do it perf properly. And then from there, when an organization has the remediative actions that should be rolled out from those as-is assessments, then you can have a good feel for how much you need to budget for the following years for, for your 2B uh, migration. Excellent advice, thank you. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, take any questions that are uh, in the um, submitted in the chat uh, right now. So the first question we have is from Raj. Um, so Raj uh, says, what steps should a hedge fund take to try to stop inbound wire fraud? Isn't that happening on the client's bank side? Uh, let's go ahead and start. Uh, let's see, Ken Matz, you want to take a go at this? Sure thing. Um, I would tell Raj and I would tell um, anybody who asks a, a similar question like that. Um, it's it, There's not one answer to stopping inbound wire fraud. There's going to be, and I'll, I'll leave it to my colleague, Michael, because he's the expert, but there's going to be the security side. There's going to be the control side from, from Ken's perspective. As far as technology, my corner of the world, it's a combination of people processes and technology. It's not just one or the other. And getting data in the right situation, in the right position to be able to properly monitor and consistently monitor is what's gonna let you pick up those techniques and patterns and then learn from those in a cyclical fashion for, for the feedback loop um, so that you can work on the most productive alerts so that you can stop the the fraudulent wires versus the legitimate ones. And um, you're, you're going to wanna to ask questions of the potential vendors that you're gonna to use to help yourself to make sure that they include analytics in the mix. It's one thing to be able to look at averages and means and standard deviations, but anal analytical intelligence or AI, machine learning, like Ken White was talking about before, you know, it's in the sweet spot of what we do, Danielle. Um, you, in today's day and age, you can't afford not to be asking questions of the vendors, regardless of which section it is, Michael's, Ken's, or, or Ken Wise, or, or mine, um, for helping to stop fraud like that. Excellent, thank you. Um, Ken, uh, your mark, what can you uh, talk about what you've seen on the accounting and, and forensic side? So I've got to backtrack for a second because I, I want to just add a comment relating to the, the earlier question that you had asked um, about, you know, approaches to budgeting. So if I could just step back for a second, because, you know, <clears throat> we were talking about the ROI and, and it's so difficult in some cases to kind of quantify that whole scenario. But if in fact um, an investor were looking at two separate firms, right? And they saw one firm really highlighted its preventive measures and what it had put in place as far as trying to reduce the risk of that organization. And another investment firm was really not focused on that. Um, which one do you think the pension fund would invest with? I mean, at the end of the day, you're trying to reduce the risk of the company, but you're also trying to reduce the risk of the investors in your company, right? So if, if you can really show it from a marketing perspective that you have the right controls in place um, that are going to prevent that that next um, you know fraud that's going to take place uh, that next penetration into your organization 
I really believe that that is going to help that company from a profitability perspective. So it's almost like all of these these areas are looked at as, you know, it's going to cost me from the bottom line perspective. But if you can try and show your your um, your board of directors um, and your investors that this is really not just a cost factor. This is really something that's going to make you better and it's going to streamline your organization at the at the end of the day. It's going to let you sleep better at night and ultimately it's going to allow you to focus more on the day-to-day -day operations of your organization and make you a better company. I think that those are really, really positive, positive factors. Um, so I, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to let I'm going to let Michael talk about the wire fraud aspect a little bit more. Well, so, so just a quick, what Ken, Ken Wyther said is so dead on. We're seeing that especially with institutional investors, not so much with, with you know, with non-institutional investors, but the institutional investors have become very savvy. And it's 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 a marketing point to, to address that. On the wire side, we like to simplify it. And I'll tell you the way, way we simplify the wires. Um, there's a kind of famous court case, Tillich Commodities versus SSMC. If you want to look it up. Um, basically, Tillich was put out of business. Six million dollars went to China over a period of a month because their fund administrator took email requests and, and responded to them. Um, those days are kind of gone, guys. I think all the fund administrators are aware of that. So the wires that we're seeing that are still working um, predominantly, believe it or not, are real wires, okay? Think about an inbound patriarch who's working on AOL mail, which, as I mentioned before, has all sorts of garbage coming through, and sooner or later, this person uh, got their computer hacked, their email hacked, Criminals are seeing everything that's coming through. They see an outbound wire, and they then are able to affect a fake email that looks like it comes from the manager that says, we're ready, everything's in there, and they give false wiring instructions. Um, that's one we're seeing a lot now because we're going after the investors who are not as savvy as the managers. Um, and that's why I think every manager has a right to, to push their controls down to their investors uh, in their subscription docs, if, if need be. On the other side, what we're seeing, think about capital calls, uh, an actual capital call where the embedded instructions for the wiring information is fraudulent, and that those are very effective. So with all that said, the, the lessons I would say is for every wire, double check the wiring instruction and call the person if you're sending it, call the person if you're receiving it. If you do those two things, you will not lose your money to a fraudulent wire. Yeah, my dad works at a bank, and he makes sure to to tell all of his folks that too. So yeah, yeah, and and Danielle, let me just hit that because we have a lot of people that go, no, I've got this multi-factor token that works with the bank, so that the wire won't go badly. Um, newsflash: If you're giving the bank bad instructions, they're gonna support very securely your poor request. That's all I'd say because I keep hearing people say we've got the token with the bank, we're good. Excellent. Um, so what else, is there anything else that I uh, haven't asked that, that you think would be important to mention? Um, should we start with Ken Y first or who, anyone want to volunteer? Yeah, I mean, the only thing, I, 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 I always go back to reemphasizing that, you know, we are in a world right now that's, that's changing uh, and it's going to continue to change. And I think that from a controls perspective, from a monitoring perspective, uh, we all need to keep that in mind and constantly be revisiting what what our system what our systems look like, what the structure of our organization looks like, and then making modifications on a regular basis. Because if we just kind of throw this stuff up on the shelf and say, you know, our controls are great and let's go on to the next thing, um, the fraudsters are out there. And they understand the process and they are very, very smart. If they would spend their time doing something that was probably good, they'd probably be very successful at what at, at some other business. But they've decided that this is the easiest way for them to go to make a quick buck. Um, but they're good at what they do. And we have to work hard at keeping them at bay. Great. Uh, Ken Matz. What, from a technology perspective, and I know this is a really big issue for a lot of folks out there, um, what, what would you offer? What advice would you offer? Well said by Ken Y. A lot of what all three of us do plays hand in hand with each other, but probably even more so um, what Ken Y does and, and what we do in, in, in terms of corners of the world. But I would, I would remind everybody to keep in, in, in mind 
it goes back to the budgeting question, Danielle. People, processes, and technology. Technology cannot work alone. If you've got good technology on top of bad processes, you're going to find issues. If you've got good people on top of bad processes and mediocre technology, you're going to find some issues. And at the end of the day, from a budgeting perspective, I would tell everybody, and, and Danielle, you know, our business re relies on technology and, and using that technology to do data and analytics and, and augment processes. But data first, the best monitoring techniques and analytics are nothing without good data. Data first, processes second, technology third. It's great to bring in cool technology. It's important to bring in technology to do more with less in today's day and age. But without the data, and the right processes, the technology is only going to achieve some fraction of what it's capable of achieving. Isn't that garbage in, garbage out, Ken? Straight ahead, Ken. Garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that highlights, I think, what what Michael you were saying earlier too, and that it's not about the sexy. It's it is it does uh, in this case start with the data. Um, what are your thoughts? Um. Sometimes people ask me what they should do. Like, for example, what what do I need to spend money on today so I'm good? And all I would say is it's the journey. It's not an end state. And unfortunately, we, we ain't seen nothing yet. Um, we are still on the forefront of an international global cyber war. We're all in the middle of it. And unfortunately, very few of us are being protected. And there's so much collateral damage that those that are not protecting themselves or you know the, the, they've got their head stuck in the sand so to speak the proverbial ostrich are at some point going to realize that they made a bad risk decision and not just because they need a program now or they need to defend themselves now but because by putting a program in place they'll be more prepared to respond to the threat tomorrow that's going to be 10 times worse i, I hate to look at it that way but i you know i think the theme here is we find that criminals are much better than we are. They're always ahead of us. When, when I do training, I always tell people, I, I apologize in my training presentations right up front. And I say, I can only tell you what I've seen in the rearview mirror. I know what they did yesterday and last week. I don't know what they're doing today, but I can guarantee whatever attacks they're doing today are better than yesterday. And they're going to be much better next week. And until people start basically making this an ongoing effort, it's, it's going to be a problem. Excellent. Uh, well, I want to thank you, uh, thank the three of you for participating in the panel. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, the Hedge Fund Association for uh, allowing us to conduct such a, uh, an event. And um, finally, uh, thank you very much to Zencos, our sponsor, and all of you for attending today's webinar. We hope it's been informative and helpful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.